Shalom. <clears throat> so, um, wasn't planning on coming back on, but um, my son's grandparents were just come back into town and uh, have a couple hours here, and I wanted to jump into speaking about Yahweh's heavenly counsel um, and try to bring some more light to some of the discussions we were having prior, not only about the serpent seed in Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> and then the first incursion that takes place with the giants in Genesis chapter 6, but also understanding that Yahweh, being who he is, being all in all, holding everything together by, the, by his own power. Uh, a lot of people will ask, I just had somebody ask me shortly uh, ago about what is the difference between, if I don't believe in a trinity, what is the difference between Yeshua Yahweh's spirit and Yahweh himself because Yahweh is a spirit um, so this is kind of a tricky discussion to have without having a good understanding on how Yahweh's counsel works how he uh, works through means means of agency um, so <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to kind of go through uh, not only the count the heavenly counsel but also to try to explain agency and how we view the Messiah as this angel of Yahweh, right? The angel of the Most High. And no, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not Mormon. Um, I'm not a Christian. I'm just a follower of the way. I follow scripture. I read what the scripture says in context. Um, and that's what I base my belief on, what the prophets say, all of those things. So. We're going to start off in um, <clears throat> Genesis 126. And it says, Then God, so then Yahweh, or Elohim, said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the flying creatures, over the sky, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land. So, in from my perspective, because I don't believe in the Trinity anymore, I now believe um, that Yahweh's sons, his heavenly sons, are angels. And we will start to go through scripture and hopefully it'll start to shed some light on why we know that based on the scriptures that we read. And not only that, but breaking down words. I've been seeing people saying that it's dangerous to take scripture and break the words down in Hebrew and Greek, which is silly to me. Why would you allow a book that you know that they've removed the original names 5,400 times and trust that book over an original copy of something. Now, I understand the original scrolls were said to have been burned down in the temple. However, I believe that there were other copies of the original copies, if that makes sense, because a lot of the uh, people from Judah would take these uh, animal skins and they would write on the animal skins and they had the Torah memorized. So, for instance, um, the woman that is caught in the act of uh, adultery, right? They bring her out before the Messiah, and they try to get the Messiah to stone her. Well, there are several problems with that. Number one, the Messiah was not part of their council. Anybody who who committed a crime back there had to can had to. Uh, bring somebody before this council and they had to establish a matter upon two or three witnesses. So there was a, a couple things wrong right out of the gate here. Number one, they didn't bring the man. So when a woman commits adultery, the man has to be brought as well. Number two, the Messiah was not part of the council that would have been responsible for judging the woman or the man. Number three, the Messiah was fulfilling prophecy during this period of time. Now, it tells us when we read through that, when they brought the woman out, that the oldest person there that had the stones that were ready to stone her to the youngest dropped their stones and left. The reason for that was is the older people had the Torah memorized better than the younger people did. So it happened in a trickle effect. So the older people, the older people that were standing there with rocks in their hand and the Messiah says, he without sin cast the first stone. But remember, the Messiah was bending down and he was writing stuff on the earth. 
he was fulfilling prophecy out of the book of Jeremiah. And it, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm not going to go to it because that's not what the teaching is about. But basically what the prophecy said was those that um, wouldn't recognize him or wouldn't hear his voice, their names would be written in the dust of the earth. So this was part of Torah. They knew this. So immediately, here's the Messiah scribbling in the dirt. And what do we see? The oldest person is like, oh, wow, this is the Messiah that was spoken about in Deuteronomy. So he drops his stones, and then the guy below him, youngest, oldest to youngest, drop their stones, and they walk away. Now, then you have the Messiah telling Mary, go and sin no more. I mean, he, of course, he says other things. He asks her, where, where are your accusers? And she said that they're, they're gone. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but my point being is, there's an order and a structure for everything, right? So if we can't look into the things and have understanding about the stories that we're reading, then it makes it very difficult for us to have an opinion on something, doesn't it? So if the woman was being brought forth, how could the Messiah stone her when he, he wouldn't be part of that council? He was just the man walking around that knew the Torah. It was his custom to go into the synagogues and preach the Torah. But it wasn't his job to stone people that were offending other people. These were the scribes and Pharisees trying to set him up. And he was fulfilling the prophecy that he was meant to fulfill in that moment. So as we go through this, just try to bear with me because I'm going to break these things down and I'm going to show you, um, starting with one of the oldest books in the 66 book canon, which is the book of Job. And in Job 1.6 it says, I'm actually... Uh, reading this also from the Tree of Life version, so bear with me. I might jump back and forth to the KJV because I'm, believe it or not, I've gotten very used to reading from the KJV. I actually don't mind it as much, but um, I'm just going to read it in this version. It says, One day the sons of Yahweh came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan uh, also came with them. Now, we know that this goes on, and Yahweh says, from where do you come? He's talking to Satan, and Satan says, I'm, I come from to and fro, from going to and fro on the earth. So we know that, obviously, they weren't on the earth when this is taking place. So we see Satan and the sons of God are approaching Yahweh. So if Satan came also to present himself with the sons of God, then this being the oldest book in the 66 book canon tells us that the sons of God are the angels. And the reason we know that is because the Hebrew word right here is B'nai Ha Elohim. Or it, it, it can be said in many different ways. Some people say B'nai Elohim. Some say Ben Elohim. Some say B'nai Ha Elohim. Either way, the word literally means the sons of Yahweh. So, does Yahweh, first of all, I guess my first question would be now, does Yahweh have sons? Because if we go to Job 38, verse 7, it says that when Yahweh completed the earth before mankind was on the earth, when he was talking to Job, he said that all of the sons of God and the stars sung for joy at the completion of the earth. So that right there tells us that the angels were with Yahweh before the earth was even in existence. Upon its creation, the, the, the foundation of the cornerstone being laid, the angels were there. And that tells us that Yahweh was creating through his sons, right? The B'nai Elohim, exactly. Um, all right, so let's go to uh, Job 2.1. Again, the day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan arrived among them also to present himself before Yahweh. So again, there's two witnesses right there that Yahweh has heavenly sons, which he calls angels. Now, there are elder books outside of the 66 book canon that literally explain to us how these angels work, what their functions are, and we know based on just the 66 books that Michael is one of the uh, most powerful uh, archangels as far as uh, battle goes. He's over chaos and the better part of mankind. So we know that in Daniel uh, 12 verse 1 when the restrainer Michael is removed, the logical thing that happens next would be chaos would ensue because he's the one that is controlling and keeping all of those things back. 
Um, Genesis 6. Actually, let me pull this up. Um, let me, yeah, let me, let me pull up just the regular KJV because I'm used to reading from that, and I think it'll be easier to to do that. Genesis 6. Okay, now Genesis 6 through 8 says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God the Bene Elohim saw that the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives which they chose now there's an interesting study on this and there's a reason why women are supposed to have head coverings so these sons of God it's said that uh, sperm or the seed of a woman can be viewed upon through her hair this is the reason why scripture says that women are to cover their hair and all this other stuff as far as when they're praying to god right and it was out of a out of a sign of respect for the most high it wasn't something that yahweh was like you need to have your hair covered you're tempting me none of that but we do see that the sons of god are looking down and they're watching over the daughters of men mankind um, and they're seeing that these women are attractive. And it is said, it's not, this is not a, a fact, but it is said that they were lusting over them because they could see their, their hair was uncovered. That's neither here nor there. I just thought that was interesting. I uh, watched a video on it. I think it was uh, Dr. Hauser that was Heiser or something like that. Um, let's see, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for he is also flesh yet his days shall be 120 years and there were giants in the earth in those days and after that when the sons of god came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them and the same became mighty men so these ben elohim came into the daughters of men bearing children which became mighty men giants now many people will say well no that's not possible these are the sons of seth well, the sons of Seth were not known as the mighty men, and they didn't become giants. So show me anywhere in here where it talks about the sons of Seth or the sons of Cain, and I will agree with you. However, you won't find that anywhere in here. So we know that there was some sort of incursion with the watchers, and we, as we move on through prophecy, you see that Satan was the lead cherub over the Garden of Eden, which is why that was the first incursion that takes place in the Garden. Uh, verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing, and fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. Now, there's a very interesting uh, point here as you start to go through verse 9. I strongly urge you look, to look up what the, the word generations uh, is speaking about and why Noah was said to be perfect in all of his generations. Um, there's a lot of interest, interesting things there. Because it goes on to say that all flesh had corrupted itself. So... Not only did the angels come down in human form, take on human form as angels do when they come to the earth sometimes, um, but they were now trapped in that flesh and they were now defiling themselves with other beings that were on the earth. I'm reading from the KJV right now and uh, the Tree of Life version as well. So, where did the watchers get this idea from? We went through this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see I have a, an entire teaching. The most recent video uh, seems to be one of the most interesting to people so far, but the one that I'm talking about is Genesis chapter 3. And this is where the serpent beguiles Eve or seduces Eve. Um, and uh, the words that are used in chapter 3 in Hebrew, one of the words for touch uh, when he's when she's Satan's asking, did Yahweh say that you're not allowed to touch any of the trees or eat of any of the trees of the garden? And she says, yes, we're we're allowed to eat of all the trees of the garden, but of this tree we're not allowed to touch or eat. 
if you look at that word touch in Hebrew, it means nagaz, or to lay with, or it's a euphemism. It's a nice way of saying to have intercourse with. So as you go through Genesis chapter 3, you start to see, especially from the very first uh, verse there, it says that the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Yahweh had made. Um, so we see that Satan is referred to all throughout Scripture. This wasn't a snake on a tree. Um, because Revelation 12.9 gives us multiple names for Satan. He's called the great dragon. He's called an ancient serpent. He's called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Um, and he was also known to be a cherub, an angel, a Ben Elohim, all of these things. So Revelation 13.18, here is wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is a number of a man. His number is 666. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to break this down too much, but this number 666 did not exist in the Greek. Um, what did exist was Kaizi Stigma, which are three uh, signs, right? So this Kaizi Stigma, when it's translated, uh, translates into an entire another name which is something the Messiah warned us about, that when the Messiah was on the earth, he said, I have come in uh, my Father's name, but if someone else were to come in their name, you would receive them. And sure enough, when we get to Revelation 13, 18, this starts to make sense because they, we have accepted another name. Uh, now, as far as back to this heavenly council, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and no wonder for Satan himself, transforms himself into an angel of light so let's take a look at that um, in the kjv second corinthians eleven fourteen. this is quite interesting because it says that uh, not only does satan do that but it's no wonder that his um did i go to the right one oh, 14 i think second corinthians 11 14. And it's no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So we know Satan can transform himself. But it says, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So these are the seeds of Cain, or the seeds of Satan. But the interesting part about this is, Satan being... Um, in the position that he's in, he's still prince and power of the air. He still has authority here on the earth over those who don't walk in the will of the Father and keep the testimony of the Messiah. However, Satan, along with other beings on the earth, can transform themselves into human flesh. Now, we know this also because of the scripture that tells us that we need to be cautious of who we entertain because we could be entertaining angels unaware. Um, so this hopefully will help make Genesis chapter uh, 3 that I've done the teaching on um, and Genesis chapter 6 make more sense because people will say, well, angels don't, they can't have uh, sexual intercourse with human beings. Sure they can. You just have to understand what the scripture says, especially in the New Testament. It talks about it quite a bit. Okay, so now we're going to see how Yahweh... Yahweh speaks to us, but he hides truth from the world because it's not meant for everyone to understand. So, for instance, the Messiah spoke in parables. The Messiah spoke in parables so that the scribes and Pharisees and unbelievers wouldn't understand his speech. This is what he told his disciples. But the Father also writes the scripture and the prophets are coded as well. So I say coded because there are many people that are in the live right now in this chat uh, and people that uh, have come to the knowledge of this truth, when you read through prophecy, I've read through prophecy my entire life, and never did I understand it until I had the spirit of prophecy, which is the Messiah. So when you start reading through the prophecy, it's written in a way to where if you read it with your carnal mind, it's not going to make any sense. It'll make sense. It'll tell you a story, but it'll tell you a story that will contradict with the 35 or 4,500 other denominations that all claim to have the truth. So if we read according to what the prophets say, the prophets are all telling us the same story. And I go by that because that's how we establish a matter by two or three witnesses. 
And if all the prophets are telling us the same story, then we know that's the truth and we don't have to guess and wonder which denomination has what right. So this is how Yahweh speaks. And we'll, we'll, we're going to use a little bit of this here in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 27. At that time, Yeshua said in response, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and discerning and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was pleasing to you. So right here, the Messiah is letting us know that Yahweh did this on purpose. He hid these things from those that claim that they're wise, for those that are wise in their own eyes, that uh, don't heed to the things that are written, and they don't go by the Spirit, they go by their feelings and their emotions. Verse 27, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So we see that the Son is the only one that will reveal the Father to us in Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 3, where John brings New Jerusalem. He sees New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven with Yahweh, um, uh, adorned as a bride. Um, so that's the purpose of the thousand-year millennial reign, right? 1 Corinthians one twenty-seven says, Yet God chose the foolish things of the world so he might put to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world so that he might put to shame the strong. So again, this is kind of speaking on the same thing. For those that put their pride and their own understanding aside, and we allow Scripture to speak, the prophets to speak, we get a much clearer picture of the things that it is that Yahweh is trying to teach us. Um, now let's jump to Second Timothy. Second Timothy three one. Just, okay, so Second Timothy, starting in th uh, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves, uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Yahweh, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. So these are, this is speaking of those, uh, the people that walk around and claim that they know or have the Spirit very boldly. They'll say, the, 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 the Spirit is in me and Yahweh's laws are written on my heart and all I have to do is confess the name of the Most High. That's it. This is what this is speaking of. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. How do you walk in the power of the Spirit? You keep the commandments of the Most High. You use the proper names. You keep the Sabbath holy. And you keep the testimony of His Son, according to Scripture. Not my opinion. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So it is possible for us to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jan, Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Um, men of corrupt minds and reprobate concerning the faith. So these are the same men in Jude 1 where it says certain men have crept in unawares um, trying to change the word of the Most High. These are clouds without water and all of these other things genesis uh chapter 3 6 through 7 so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit and ate she also gave it to her husband and he ate and then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings now this uh, pri the primal root word for the word that was in uh, for tree that's in the center of the garden means to close one's eyes. Now, isn't that interesting that they were already walking around in the image of the Most High with their spiritual eyes open, 
but now they've partaken from this tree that is bearing very bad fruit. And because they partook of this tree that bears very bad fruit, their spiritual eyes were just closed, and now their physical eyes are opened and they're ashamed. And we just read, if you read prior, we didn't today, but we have in the past, if you read Gen uh, Genesis 2, the very last chapter in Genesis 2 said, the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. So now you have to kind of wonder, does the crime fit the punishment here? Because if the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked, they didn't sew fig tree leaves around their mouth. They realized that they were naked. So this tree was one that was pleasant to the eyes, one that was desirable to make one wise. So she took of the fruit and she ate. So in other words, she was seduced. Beguiled means to be seduced. So again, you cover your nakedness, you're ashamed of your nakedness because of what you have done, what you've just partaken in. You've just partaken in something that you shouldn't have done. Genesis 3, 10 through 19. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. I was naked and I hid myself. This is Adam. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I have commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said to the woman, you gave to be with me, the woman, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And Yahweh said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So then Yahweh said to the serpent, Now listen very closely. And I'm not just going to be in Genesis 3. I'm going to be moving past this very quickly. Because you have done this, this is Yahweh speaking to Satan. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all of the cattle and above every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will place enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and between her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for you to rule over your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, let's break this down. Yahweh is placing enmity between the serpent and the woman forever. Now, he's also going to place enmity between Satan's seed, because that's who he's talking to, and the woman's seed, which was Adam's, because a woman doesn't have seed. So he's speaking of this word seed here means sperm. So there's two children that Eve has now been impregnated with by two different beings. Number one, Adam. Number two, Satan. If you don't believe that, you can easily go into the New Testament and start reading some of the scriptures there that says Cain was of that wicked one. So if you say that Cain came from Yahweh, then you're calling Yahweh wicked. Um, and again, I would strongly recommend going into the Genesis 3 uh, teaching that I did on this because it goes into great detail. It's and nearly impossible for you to miss if you see it um, and you study it and then you see that Cain's not part of Adam's lineage. Uh, and Cain is actually a completely different nation who all of the offspring of Cain become giants. So it's a little bit strange that it happens that way, but that's the way it happens. Uh, but here's the punishment. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Not one. He said two. He said children. Your desire shall be for your husband. Why? Because her desire was for Satan to begin with. It wasn't ever for Adam. Uh, and he shall rule over you. So her desire will be, a woman's desire would always be to rule over her husband, but she never will be able to. Uh, except for in the end days, it says that women will rule over men, which is what's happening now. Um, and then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So what does a man have to do all the days of his life? A man has to get up, go to work, nearly kill himself to make a living, and he has to live by the sweat of his brow, which is exactly what took place here. They weren't having to do any of this stuff prior because their eyes were spiritually opened. But they allowed this 
uh, tree which was in the center of the garden, the lead cherub of the garden who fell because iniquity was found in him, because he wanted to exalt his throne above the throne of the Most High, which we read about later on in the book of Isaiah. Um, unfortunately, mankind falls. Genesis 4, we see that... Um, Four one, we see that Eve believes that she's received Cain from the Lord because she says uh, she's pregnant and she has given birth and I have produced a man with Yahweh is what she says. Then she gave birth again to her brother, uh, to his brother Abel, and Abel became a shepherd of flocks, while Cain became a worker of the ground. And then we see Cain goes on to uh, murder his brother. Uh, and then when Yahweh questions Cain, he says, uh, you know, where is your brother Abel? And Cain's response is, uh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now we're told in scripture, and it's made very clear if we're walking in the will of the Father, we know that we are our brother's keeper. And we know there's no greater gift than to lay your life down for your brother. So uh, again, we see that Cain is marked and then he's sent out and uh he finds a wife, and then he starts his lineage. So when you look at the lineage of Adam, it starts with Seth. Then you see Cain has his own lineage as well. So Cain is now separate from the family of Adam and Eve. And there's reason for that. It goes into much more detail, but I don't want to go too far into that because we've already been over it. Uh, now in Jude 4.4 4 it says, For certain people have crept in secretly, unaware, those who from long ago have been marked out for this judgment. Same mark that Cain received. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of Yahweh into indecency and deny our only master and Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Jude 11 uh, through 12. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They were consumed by the uh, play, the, by, they were consumed for pay and Balaam's error and Korah's rebellion. They have been destroyed. Those people are hidden, rocky reefs at your love feast, shamelessly feasting with you. Tending only to themselves, they are waterless clouds carried along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, doubtably dead and uprooted. Again, that's a different version than the KJV. John 8.44, you are of your father the devil, and your desires are of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks of a lie, he speaks of, in, of himself because he is the father of lies. So, the very first murder took place where? With Cain and Abel. It says right here that, uh, he's speaking about you're the father of your devil. You're you're of your father the devil. Speaking of the scribes and Pharisees. Um, so again, this is why the Messiah in Matthew three seven refers to them as a brood of vipers. If you look at the root word there, it means serpent seed. So he uh, Matthew three seven he says, but when uh, this is actually John the Baptist saying it here, but um, I think the Messiah says it later on. Uh, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the immersion or to the baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. And then he goes on to say, Do not think that you can call Abraham your father. Uh, this is the Messiah, though. Matthew twelve thirty four. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, now that we've covered that, I want to go into this, keep the conversation on this heavenly council. Does Yahweh have a heavenly council of sons who are gods? Lowercase g gods. Psalm 82.1 A psalm of Asaph. God takes his stand in the assembly of God. He judges amongst the gods. Lowercase g. So that's Psalms 82.1. So this is saying that Yahweh stands in the assembly and he judges among the gods. So in the beginning, God said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. God was speaking to his sons, including Yeshua. The heavenly council is where Yahweh tells his sons what to do and where to do it and how to do it. Remember, 
All things were created by him, for him, and through him, the Messiah. Every time Yahweh speaks, his angels go out and they make things happen. Um, Luke 4.10 For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. So, again, this is when uh, the Messiah is being tempted. Satan saying, you know, even if you were to dash your foot on a stone, your father will send his angels to protect you. So this is, Yeshua is being tested over and over again uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. But, here again, we see that his angels are commanded to do things, right? Hebrews 1.4 Thus he became as far as above the angels as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. So again, we went through Hebrews 1.4 earlier. I'll have that uploaded uh, tonight along with this one, hopefully both of them tonight. If not, this second one will be up by tomorrow. Um, but this right here is Hebrews 1. We went through the entire chapter of Hebrews earlier explaining how many times the Messiah is being compared to as an angel. Now, Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I am sending an angel before you to guard you in the way and to bring you into the place that I have prepared. Now, if we look at this, I'm going to look at this in the KJV. It's very interesting, right? First, let's do this. Let's read Deuteronomy 18. So, I would have to ask, the, the question I would have to ask is, does anyone in here believe that Yahweh is a prophet? Or is Yahweh God? Is Yahweh uh, ruler of, of heaven and earth, and does he make everything happen? We wouldn't call him a prophet, right? Scripture says he speaks through his prophets. So in Deuteronomy 18, 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. So this is Mount Sinai, the laws being given. Saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. So they were terrified to see him. And the Lord said unto me, Moses, they have well spoken which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. Now let me ask you this. When the Messiah was born, he was born from the tribe of Judah. So this is prophecy being fulfilled once he's born. He comes from the tribe of Judah. Yahweh says he's raising up a prophet from among them, like unto their brethren. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall not speak in the name, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So there's a prophet test in Deuteronomy 13 where you can test to see if a prophet truly is a prophet. Um, which I would highly recommend everybody do. That way you're not fooled by these people that are on TikTok claiming to be prophets because they're not prophets. Um, so now let's go back to Exodus 23. We just heard what Yahweh said. He's going to place his words in the mouth of this prophet, right? So now when we get to Exodus 23.20, reread... Uh, was it Exodus 23? Exodus 23, 20. Yeah. Oh, I'm in Genesis. That's why. Exodus 23. Okay. So Exodus 23, 20. Again, Moses is being spoken to here. And Moses is being told by Yahweh, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, of the angel, and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Did somebody come to pardon our transgressions? He did, but at this point he hadn't come yet. For my name is in him. In who? In the angel that he's sending before Moses to keep them safe. 
and this is the reason why he's telling them, obey him. My name is in him. Now, didn't he not just speak about a prophet who he will raise up, which will be born in human flesh later on? However, this is telling us very specifically when the Messiah said, before Abraham was, I am, ego, I, me, I existed. This simply means that, yes, before Abraham was, the Messiah was with God before the foundations of the earth were complete. The Messiah was with the Most High since the very beginning. Let's read out of Proverbs. I said I would do that earlier today, and I didn't have enough time. I had to jump off. Um, let's read Proverbs 8 really quickly. And I want you to hear this, because all throughout the New Testament, I can give you uh, witness after witness after witness that wisdom is the Messiah. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I was brought forth. What does Hebrews 1 tell us? That the Messiah is the only begotten. That word begotten means brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he had prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set the compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea this decree, his decree that the water should not pass his commandment when he appointed the, found, the foundations of the earth. We read about this in Job 38. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was his daily delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Now you have to ask yourself a question here. If the Messiah was brought up with God, and he was his delight daily from the beginning, from before the earth was, before the earth was created, you have to ask yourself, who would be willing to lay their life down, come to the earth, to leave heaven as a son, the most high, the, the most highest of all of the sons of God, to come down to the earth and to die for the sins or the transgressions of what he calls us, his brothers and sisters, for 33 years, uh, 33 and a half years, he comes down and risks sinning one time in the flesh and not being able to return to his first estate just as the other angels who came and sinned and are unable to return back to their first estate so people say angels can't sin that's not what the new testament says the book of john says otherwise all right so let's keep going here um where was i at so Matthew twenty four thirty six. But of the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. So now we're seeing, again, part of this heavenly council. Acts 4.28 For truly, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, were gathered together in the city against your holy servant, Yeshua, whom you anointed. They did whatever your hand and your purpose predetermined to happen. Again, this is a very clear picture of the fact that Yeshua was sent by his Father. But not only that, everything was predetermined to happen exactly the way that it happened, according to Yahweh's purpose. And again, we, we heard the Messiah tell Pilate, uh, not only in the 66 books, but if you read the Acts of Pontius Pilate, you see that the Messiah tells Pontius Pilate if he wanted, he could call legions of angels down on his behalf. He made it very clear to Pilate, the only reason you have power is because my father gave it to you. Um, Ephesians 1.11 In him we are also chosen predestined according to his plan. He keeps working out all things according to the purpose of his will. Luke twenty two twenty two. For indeed the Son of Man is going, has been predetermined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So in other words, Judas, 
Uh, it says it'd been better if he never would have been born. And people will oftentimes say, "Oh, there's a there's flaws in your Bible." Uh, one one of the stories say that Judas, uh, his stomach was burst asunder, and the other one said he hung himself. Well, if you did some study on the location of where he hung himself, it was over the corner of a cliff, or on the corner of the uh, of an embankment. His body. He died and probably started to decay. Or the branch broke or something took place to where his body fell and then his stomach burst asunder. And then that's the ground that became uh, cursed ground or whatever you want to call it. So, um, all, the, where, all these predetermined things, where did they take place? Because if something's predetermined, it had to have taken place somewhere prior. It had to have been established somewhere prior. So that brings us back to Genesis 1.26. Then Yahweh said, Let us create man in our image after our likeness. Does that mean we look like them? No. This means we were created in their image, their likeness. So, who is Yahweh speaking to? Now let's think of this from a different perspective now. Would it make sense if Yahweh is in heaven speaking to himself, who is in the flesh, which according to Trinitarians, they believe that uh, Yeshua was born here on earth, so he couldn't have been talking to his fleshly self because his fleshly self wasn't born yet. And then the Holy Spirit was also. So this is the idea, at least that I was taught and that I hear most Trinitarians teach, that Yahweh, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit are the ones that are speaking here in Genesis 1.26. Would it not make more sense after reading the book of Revelation knowing that there are other angels that Yahweh calls his sons, the Ben Elohim, according to the book of Job? Does it not make more sense now that Yahweh is speaking to his sons? Let us create because he creates through his sons. All things are created by him, for him, and through him, Yeshua, the Son of God. John eight fifty eight. Yeshua answered, Amen, amen, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. That word, I am, is lowercase for one. It is not the same I am that I am that was given to Moses. This means ego, I mean, I existed. Before Abraham was, I existed. We just read that. The angel of Yahweh, which appeared in the burning bush, which appeared uh, before Joshua, um, who was the captain of the Lord of hosts, which we'll get into if we have some time here. Job 38, 4 through 7. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its dimensions, if you know, or who stretched a line over it? On what were its foundations set on, or who laid its cornerstone? But we're on a globe spinning, right? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, so, I have to ask you again, does Yahweh have B'nai Ha and El Elohim that are in heaven that created all things? When Yahweh speaks, do not all things get created because he speaks? So, why do we as believers assume that Genesis 1.26 is speaking about three of the same people that are one, and not these heavenly beings, this heavenly council? So, if you have a Strong's Concordance and you're interested, you can look up Strong's 430. It means Elohim, and it'll give you the description of what Elohim means. So if you're speaking of Elohim as God, it will simply just say Elohim, capital G-O-D, which is one of the first that are listed. But Elohim with B-E-N-E -E or B-E-N before it, son, would mean sons of God. And so the word Elohim can mean exceedingly, God, gods, goddess, godly, judges, mighty, rulers, shrine. So there are multi multiple, multiple versions of what Elohim means. But normally when we see Elohim 23:26, it's speaking directly about Yahweh himself. Now, let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the main scripture. Now, I'm going to share a little bit of information with you, a little bit of history. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark was the first book that was, uh, the first scroll that was established. I'll put it that way. 200 years later comes um, Luke, and then um, Mark, I believe, or Mark, no, Mark, Luke, and then Matthew, and then John. John is the last book that was written, which came nearly 400 years, if I'm not mistaken, after. So this, by this point, the Council of Nicaea had already done its thing. People were already fighting over the divinity of God and whether or not there was a trinity. The problem is, is all of the people that walked with Yeshua knew that he was sent by his father. They knew that he wasn't God. And people will use scriptures like um, Thomas, when he sticks his hand through Yeshua's fingers, finger hand, and he says, uh, my Lord and my God. Well, again, this is all thanks to the KJV removing names from scripture and replacing them with Lord and God instead of leaving the 5,400 translations of the names that were supposed to be in there, they, re they refused to leave that alone because they wanted to push this divinity doctrine on other people. So, in the Old Testament, we know that the word meant Torah. The Torah was the word all throughout the Old Testament, and then we get to the New Testament, and there's now new meanings. Why? Because it was just so happened that the New Testament was written in Greek when all of these things that took place, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, should have been written in Hebrew. That's the facts. Those are facts. Okay, so John 1.1. 1, 1. If we read it with the Strong's number, 8451, which means Torah, this is what Torah means. Custom, instruction, instructions, law, laws, rulings, teaching, or teachings. So, if we take John 1.1 1, 1 and we say, In the beginning was the instructions, and the instructions was with God, and the instructions was God, or the teachings you could use, or simply you could use the Torah. In the beginning was the Torah, and the Torah was with God, and the Torah was God. Yahweh has always been who Yahweh is. Now, as I said earlier, if Yahweh would have come down and died for the sins of his own children, he would have been violating his own law, which he's a just God. He won't do that. If Yahweh would have came down and remarried a harlot whom he gave a divorce letter to and separated from, that would be an abomination according to Yahweh's own law. So that leaves us with one other option. Yahweh had to send his son the first begotten, the reason why he's anointed above his other fellows or his brethren, the Ben Elohim, was because he did what no one else was able to do. He came down in human flesh for 33 and a half years and was tempted at all points without failing. And if he had failed one sin once, he would have not been able to return back to the Father. This is why he's exalted in the way that he is. So when we say that we worship God the Creator and we place no one before Him because that's the first commandment, it's not because we don't love Yeshua. And it doesn't take anything away from Yeshua. Yeshua is our brother who died for us. He laid his life down willingly. There's no greater gift than to lay your life down for one another. Or a brother, or a neighbor, however you want to say it. Yeshua did just that. He laid his life down and redeemed the lost children which is the reason why we spend a thousand years on the new earth with him. That's how he cleans us up and shows us everything that Yahweh intended to show all of Israel on Mount Sinai to begin with. But he didn't get that chance because they were too busy worshiping a trinity, the bull, the, the Baphomet, whatever you want to call it. They were doing that and it angered God so much that he was about to destroy them. And it angered Moses enough to where he took the first set of tablets that he got and broke them on the ground. So it was pretty serious what was taking place. Now, this is the next thing that people will use to try to prove that Yahweh is his son when he's not. John 10.30 I and the Father are one. 
So I have to ask you, if you just stop reading there and you don't continue to John 17, if you don't read the whole book in context, I can see how that would be a little confusing. But that word one there, it says when my wife and I got married that we became one flesh. Now that might be a stretch for some of you, so I'm going to read John 17, 11. I am no longer in the world, but they that are in the world, I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name that you might have that you might have given me so that they may they may be one just as we are one now as we go a little bit further i have to ask you now that you hear him you're hearing the messiah telling the father this so that they may become one just as you and i are one does that now make us all god are we now God because of that one scripture that people like to say, I and the Father are one? Let's go to John seventeen twenty one, That they all might become one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. So they also might be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. It doesn't say that Yahweh sent himself. Yahweh didn't anoint himself, and Yahweh certainly didn't inherit everything that was already his. Yahweh sent his son exactly like Yahweh says. So who are we to say, no, he didn't. He said he came in the flesh. No, that's not what he said. He opened the clouds up when Yeshua was being baptized in the River Jordan and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then guess what Yeshua received? His father's spirit, the same way we we receive it. So if he is God, then he wouldn't have needed to receive his own spirit, would he? That wouldn't make any sense. So, again, let's continue on. I'm just trying to wake Israel up. Israel, if you're listening, wake up. It's time to pay attention to what's going on in Scripture. It's time for those of you that are on the fence to get off the fence. Because there is no center ground. There is no gray area. There is hot and there's cold. If you're already kind of warm, you better move into being hot. Cold is one thing. Cold can be turned to hot. But if you're lukewarm and you keep slipping away from cold and you become lukewarm, you're going to be spewed, which is violently spat out of the mouth of the Most High. Psalms 48. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. So we keep hearing the same story going around on TikTok that no one can be perfect. Nobody can keep the law. It's impossible. It's impossible to keep the law, and it's impossible for you to be perfect. Matthew 5, 48. This is Yeshua speaking. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Is Yahweh teasing us here, or is Yahweh telling us that it's possible for us to be per perfect in his eyes? Will we be perfect like his son? No. But can we be seen as walking in perfection with Yahweh? Yes, absolutely. It's not hard to go every day without sinning, by the way, folks. It's not a difficult thing. Not breaking the Ten Commandments is very simple to do. And when you break the law down, the 613 laws that everybody always talks about, most of those laws apply to the Levitical priests, which no longer exist. And then the rest of the laws that you break down, if you want to read through them and put a check by the ones that apply to you, you'll be lucky if a hundred of them are for you as a person. So even those laws fall within the Ten Commandments. So if keeping the Ten Commandments is a burden to you, then I can understand why your relationship with God is difficult. Because if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. They're not a burden to you, and you don't have to take Paul's letters and twist them all around to make yourself feel better instead of just doing what God asks. The same thing the Messiah asked. Love God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, and love your neighbor. That's all. That's all you have to do. That's works. That's God's works. That's what we do. We do the works of God by bearing good fruit, by loving our neighbors, by loving God with all of our heart. If your neighbor's animal gets free, you take the animal back. That's called loving your neighbor. If your neighbor moves in and he's drop-dead gorgeous or she's drop-dead gorgeous, you don't covet the woman or the man because you're told not to do that. 
You don't go commit adultery with someone. That's not hard to not do. And if it is, pray that Yahweh helps you to stop. If you have an issue with one of those things, everybody has had issues in their life. But it is possible to get to a place of perfection where you don't do any of those things. You're not moved by your flesh. The thought, the lie that Satan brings, it comes right here every single time. There's a reason why your brain is placed right between these two things. It's because Satan and his demons are whispering continually, lie, 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 lie. And when you know truth and you become truth, as soon as that lie hits up here, boom, you shut it down and you exhaust it with truth. It's that easy. It's not difficult. I promise you. I'm not just boasting here. I'm telling you. It's not difficult to not think about sinning. It's not difficult to apologize to someone. It's not difficult to not break the Ten Commandments. It's actually, once you start walking with God, it becomes difficult to remember the last time you sinned. That's how it should be. And that's why there are people that are in Scripture that were seen as perfect before God. King David was seen as perfect before God. Moses was called a friend of God. Noah, all of these people that Yahweh used, that were people that were fouled, people like Paul. Think about what Paul did. Yet, look at all that Paul did. Paul's responsible for writing two-thirds of the New Testament. That's amazing. But yet, most people don't realize that Paul quotes from the Old Testament repeatedly. Verbatim, he's quoting the prophets con constantly. And everybody says, oh, we have to follow the law of Paul. Paul literally tells the Ephesians, did Paul die for you? Of course not. Yeshua died for you. He's your example. Yeshua said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. But we have these guys out here on TikTok that are saying, no, 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 no. Because Yeshua came, all we do is confess his name, and we're good to go. We put our feet up, we don't have to do anything else. Yet everyone that came before us had to keep the law of God. And then when we leave this earth, those that make it to the new earth, if you're wise enough to listen to what I'm saying, you're going to be doing all these things that were in the law to begin with. That's what the prophets say, and that's what God says. So if God says you're going to return back to doing all these things, why not learn how to do them now? Why not live a normal, God-fearing life? You know why? Because the fear of God has been taken from people. And we've learned to do exactly what the prophets said. People have become boasters, lovers of self. They've fallen away from truth, and they are believing a lie. And the reason you're being allowed to be allowed to believe the lie is because you keep not answering the call. Yahweh keeps calling and calling and calling. He sent over 120 prophets in the Old Testament, or more. And guess what? What did they tell him openly? We will not follow you. We will chase after other gods. We want to do what our flesh wants to do. Away with you, God. Same thing is happening now. Nothing new under the sun, right? So, again, if Yahweh is Yeshua, then explain to me these uh, scriptures I'm about to read. John 20, 17. Yeshua said to her, Do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God who is your God. Is Yeshua God? No. What Yeshua did was nailed the bill of divorcement that had separated us from God to the cross, not the law. And the, the law of sin and death, people, is you still have to keep the law. The only difference is, is because Yeshua spilled his blood, you no longer are under the curse of the law. Remember Deuteronomy 18? Follow all of these things. This day I give you choose good or evil, but choose good. And if you choose good, all of these blessings will chase you down. But if you choose evil, all of the curses of the law will chase you down for as long as you shall live. Through your generations, even through your children. So again, we're given the opportunity clearly by Yahweh from the beginning to choose to do good. But you know what it is? People want to choose to make themselves feel good. And instead, taking all of their time, watching movies, listening to garbage music, but too afraid to pick up a book and read it. That's the truth. Because your pastor said, don't read the book of Enoch, or don't read the book of Jasher, or don't read any of these holy scriptures because they're not inspired. Says who? Says who? 
a bunch of indoctrinated scholars that are responsible for owning most of the churches in America that sign away their rights, 501c3s, so that they can't speak about abortion, they can't speak about gay marriage, they can't speak at all about anything that the government's doing, or they get locked up. When the jab was going around, guess what? The people that were, the churches that were uh, getting locked up and refusing to shut their door were the same people that were in bed with the government. This is the great harlot that Revelation is talking about. This is why Yahweh says, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her plagues. The church, she, the, the great whore, is drunk with the blood of the saints. Why do you think that is? These pastors who tell you that the law has been done away with have no problem digging in your pockets and asking you for tithe money, which is part of the law, which has nothing to do with money. It was the first fruits that you were to give. So if you were a farmer, you would give 10% of the best that you had of your fruit. If you were uh, worked in meats, you gave the best part of your meats. But you also were responsible for taking care of the poor, the sick, the needy, the widow, the fatherless. When it says the widow and the fatherless, it's talking about God. People that are fatherless don't have Yahweh. It's not just speaking about in, in physical, it's speaking about spiritual as well. A widow, one who has lost her husband, the Gentile, Israel, that's who it's speaking about. All right, so why have we taken the Son of God and said, no, God, I don't believe you when you say this is my son with whom I am well with who you are well pleased. I don't believe when you say that. And I don't believe that you anointed him with the oil of gladness above his his fellows according to Hebrews 1. I want to believe that you are God in the flesh and that you came here because my pastor told me so. Such a dangerous place to be. But let's take a look at who's going to who's going to persecute us in the book of Revelation. Who will you be persecuted? When tribulation starts? Because I can guarantee you if you go to a mainstream Christian church, and this is no attack on Christians, but if you go to a mainstream Christian church, I promise you Satan's not going to bother you at all. And let me explain to you why. The dragon became wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant or the offspring of her seed. This is during tribulation. Those that keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, his son. Revelation 19.13 He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood in his name by which he is called the Word of God. That word, instructions, teachings, the law. That's his name. But he's given a new name. He has a name, Yeshua. He'll be given a new name. Because his name was never intended to be his father's word or instructions or teachings. He became and took that on to free many brothers and sisters. To bring them back into truth. So, 1 John 2, 7. Loved ones. I am not writing a new commandment for you, but an old commandment, one you had had from the beginning. This old commandment is the word that you heard from the beginning. Not a new law. It's a new, a new, a renewed covenant. If you look at the older text, it doesn't say new. It says renewed. Every covenant is established on a better covenant. And I'll give you proof. Do women still have pain when they give birth to a child? Yes. When it rains, do you still see rainbows? Yes. Did those covenants go away? No. Every covenant is established on a better covenant. It, it's not done away with. It's just established on better promises. So the old covenant, there's no such thing. It's just a renewed covenant. And it, we know this from reading Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It's very, very clear. Let's just go there really quickly. Because I want people to truly understand this. This is prophecy of the end times. 
This is when Israel becomes a nation, not in 1948. This, in Jeremiah 31, is going to tell you exactly when Israel becomes a nation again. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, let's stop. Pump the brakes. Why is Yahweh needing to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, Israel and Judah? Let me explain this. Jacob, the man, gave birth to 12 children, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob wrestles with the Messiah, and the Messiah puts his hip out of joint, and he then is renamed Israel. So the nation of Israel are the 12 tribes, Jacob's 12 sons, who are scattered abroad into the four corners of the earth because of their disobedience. This is why we're all lost right now. Judah and Benjamin are the last two tribes that were given this letter of divorcement and were sent out because our Messiah had to come through the line of Judah. He had to come through a pure bloodline. He had to come through a righteous bloodline. This is why the children, when they're being given birth to in Genesis, it tells you why Yahweh chooses who he chooses, because some of them went off and did evil. Not all of them did what they were supposed to do. These were the children that were God's people, that are no longer his people, but according to the book of Hosea, will become his people again. Loami, the, the book of Hosea, it explains all of this all of the people that were his people, these are Gentiles, folks. This is what Gentile means. It means the lost sheep, the lost tribe of the house of Israel, which are the 11 tribes minus Judah. Judah is, you could say in a sense, bought free because the Messiah came through that line. He represents Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The other, when it speaks about Israel, it's just speaking about the other 11 tribes. That's it. So just think every time you read Israel, it's speaking of the other 11 tribes. Not the land of Israel. Not Jews that are claiming to be Jews that don't even believe in the return of our Messiah. None of that. So get your mind off of that and focus on what the scripture says. Now, verse 32. He's going to establish a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. When the Messiah took them out of the land of Egypt, they refused to listen to him, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they did never get to make it into the promised land. Their children did. Joshua was a foreshadowing of Yeshua, bringing us into the thousand-year millennial reign. It's a foreshadowing. The children made it in later, after they drove the giants out, the offspring of Satan. Which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. So Yahweh is saying right here, he was a husband to them in those days when he freed them from the land of Egypt, but they broke his covenant. So he divorced them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Remember that right there, because I'm going to jump forward in a second. And, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I'm going to prove to you this hasn't happened yet. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, saith Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. How do I know this hasn't taken place yet? Number one, it says that every man will no longer teach another, saying to know Yahweh. For they all will know him from the least of them to the greatest. So we won't be teaching each other about the laws of Yahweh anymore. We'll be walking with the Messiah on the new earth for a thousand years. Now, let me read to you exactly what's being spoken of here out of the book of Revelation. If we go to Revelation 21, listen to this very closely. This is John in 
heaven seeing this vision. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Yahweh out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Now remember, he just said he was a husband to Israel of old, and they broke his covenant. Meaning, we are still currently divorced. As a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What did we just read? And God shall wipe away the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, and no more sorrow, and no more crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write the words, these words that are faithful and true. So, this new covenant, again, there's one witness. I'm going to give you another witness, okay? Because a lot of people are still very strongly convinced that this hasn't happened yet. This is in First Peter, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the, the God and Father of our Master, Yeshua HaMashiach, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten, brought us forth again unto a lively hope. What is hope? Something that you have not yet seen. Something that you're awaiting, right? Hope is something that you, you're placing your trust in something that you cannot see. Hope by the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Where is this reserved for you? In heaven. When you take off this fleshly tent, that is when this new covenant will begin. But if Yeshua returns before, if we are the last generation and tribulation starts and we make it through and we endure till the end, till the seventh trump, then when we enter in the twinkling of an eye, we get a new heart, we get renewed bodies, we all have the strength of David according to the prophecies, and then those two sticks, Judah and Israel, become one. One house. That's when Israel becomes a nation again. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of Yahweh through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So again, the new covenant will be established when this earth this earth that we're on fades away and we see this new earth, the new Jerusalem, the 144,000 with the Messiah. All right, back to where we were. So, when we see the testimony of the Son according to Revelation, we see in Matthew 5, 17, first of all, it says, Do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to fully walk out, to fully complete what man could not do. This man, who was more than just a man, who was the son, the begotten, first brought forth son, angel of the Most High, was brought here to fulfill the law, which no other man could do. And he spent 33 and a half years in the flesh and risking slipping up once and not being able to return. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that says to me, Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the, fill, the will of the Father? It tells us over and over again to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Yeshua, his son. Very, very easy. Revelation 19.10 Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said, See that you do not do it, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 22.14 One chapter ahead of the chapter we just read. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life, and they may enter through the gates into the city. There are twelve gates. There are twelve angels standing at those gates with swords in their hands. 
and those that are not worthy will not enter those gates. Simple as that. The Messiah made it very clear that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. I'm not going to go all through that. I have that in other teachings. But if you go through the Old Testament and you study the prophets, you'll see what the way is. That's why I said I'm a follower of the way. And Paul, Paul didn't teach a, a different gospel. This is what Paul taught right here. But I confess this to according to the way in which they call a heresy. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets. That's Acts 24, 14. Paul didn't preach a different gospel. Paul does not have his own gospel. Remember, we saw uh, Yahweh earlier and or Yeshua earlier calling it his gospel. I call it my gospel. So it's a, it's a, again, it's a way of speaking. Um, when I refer to my God, I always tell, if someone's saying something against God, I'm like, no, I'm not just going to sit there and allow you to speak about my God like that in front of me and disrespect me and my father or or my gospel. Not that I wrote it. It's not my gospel, but it's my gospel because I follow it and I love him. So that's why I say it that way. All right, so aside from that, here is the truth. Here is the law. This is what righteousness is according to Yahweh and Yeshua. And when you love God, you'll realize that keeping his commandments is not a burden. It's not the same as the teaching that I did prior earlier today about the traditions of men and how men have placed burdens that are too heavy for us to carry. And it's not the law of God. The law of God was never a burden. 1 John 5, 2 through 3, By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. This is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. This is in 1 John. This is the New Testament. 1 John 2, 3 through 7. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, uh, let's see, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in, in, we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. New Testament, again. Now listen to this. Daniel 9, 4 through 6. And I pray to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and the people of the land. That's Daniel speaking. And Daniel had a lot to say. Daniel prophesied about quite a bit of stuff that happens during the end days. So again, do you go to church? No, I do not go. To, I will never, ever return back to a building or a church, ever. Uh, scripture tells us to come out of the church, unless you want to take part in her plagues. There are no churches that I would agree with. Now, there are places that I will gather together with like-minded believers, and I will go over Scripture and worship and give honor and glory to the Most High, but I will never, ever go to a church building. The Messiah didn't go to church. Uh, nobody in scripture went to church they went to the synagogue but you see that paul always usually stayed outside of the synagogue to preach the torah and when yeshua did it it was his custom to go in that's how they would become i'm not even i don't even want to get into that i would i'll just say this it was yeshua's custom to go in and read from the torah in order to reach a certain level of being able to teach but i'm not going to go there because it's confusing i just i know better proverbs 28 4 those who forsake the law praise the wicked, 
but such as keep the law contend with them. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those such as keep the law contend with them, the wicked. We contend with the wicked continually because they say that the law is no longer for us. Proverbs 28, 7. Whosoever keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. Proverbs 28, 9. One who turns his ear from hearing, from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Do you want your prayers to be answered? Don't, don't dare listen to someone tell you that the law is not for us because Yahweh says he doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. Will you sin? Yes. Can you approach the throne of grace boldly and ask for forgiveness? Yes. Can you be like the Nicolaitans and continue to ask for forgiveness believing that your spirit is separate from your flesh? No. That's called hyper grace and that's why I don't go to church. Uh, 2 John 5, 7. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but one which we had had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you had heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. That's 2 John 5, 7. New Testament. John 14, 14 through 16. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. John fourteen twenty one through 23 He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, Judas not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home within him. Who is the spirit of prophecy that leads you through prophets? The prophets in the Old Testament? Yeshua. Who is your teacher? Yahweh. There's only one. One person that teaches you, one spirit that teaches you, Yahweh. Yeshua is your high priest, your mediator between you and God. When you pray at night, it should sound like this. Father Yahweh, I pray that you do X, Y, and Z. But when I start my prayer, I always call on the name of my Messiah. And I ask my Messiah, Messiah, hear my prayers, Yeshua. Make sure that I present them before the Father as holy, and make sure that I'm conveying the things that need to be said from my heart and not from my mouth. Not the things that I want. Not the things that I think that I need. God already knows everything that you need and want. God wants a relationship with us. God wants to have a relationship and a conversation back and forth with you just as if your best friend was sitting in front of you. But your best friend is not to be disrespected and called bro and all of this other stuff. Yes, God has a sense of humor. We see that God laughs at the wicked and God winks his eye and does all these things that gives us the idea. If we're created in his image, we have sense of humor. He has a sense of humor as well. However, I'm just making that point that we don't pray to God and be like, yo, what's up, bro? Like that's not, God is to be respected. Just remember that. He's He's coming back in all seriousness, folks. When Yeshua returns, it's going to be a serious day. Deuteronomy 6.25 Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now, in regards to this in Deuteronomy, I, I don't know why you're asking who Aravad is, but I would refer you stay out of the book of Enoch, that book of Enoch that you're reading from. Get the... R.H. Charles version of Enoch if you're going to read Enoch. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for, re for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, scripture is given to us when we have people say, oh man, don't be a fruit inspector. Oh man, we're not supposed to judge. Yes, we are. We're supposed to judge our brothers and sisters. 
righteously, in love. You're not supposed to go to someone and be like, uh, by the way, I saw the other day that you stole something, you stupid idiot. Don't do that. You're not supposed to steal. Meanwhile, here you are doing the same exact thing. That you're, we're warned not to do. Those that preach Torah and don't live by Torah, that are guilty of the things that they're telling other people to not do, that's dangerous ground. But those that live by Torah and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom. Isaiah 48, 17 through 18. Thus saith Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. Oh, that you had heeded to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Romans 6.13 And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Yahweh. Remember in scripture when Yeshua said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck that bad boy out, flick it in the river. Whatever you got to do to keep yourself from sinning, do it. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom missing a member of your mortal body than it will be for you to enter into the kingdom not obeying the Father's word. Remember, it says to fear him who can destroy both flesh and spirit. 1 John 3.10 In this, the children of God are the children... In this, the children of Yahweh and the children of the devil are manifest. Whosoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So we, when we practice righteousness, righteousness is the same thing as keeping Yahweh's law. We will be clothed in righteousness, white robes, meaning when we're walking in the millennium, the thousand years, we're going to be clothed in Torah. We're going to be bathed in Torah. It says there are two trees with 12 manners of fruit that rotate. These are the 12 tribes that will be teaching us, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe that will be the new priesthood that will teach us the ways of Yahweh, presenting us without spot, making us as chaste virgins, presenting us before Yahweh after the thousand-year reign so that we can be remarried back to the Father as a new creation, being reborn. I hope this is making sense. I'm I'm really doing the best that I can to not continue to sound like a broken record, but I feel like the more that I do this, the more it becomes like just your first thing that goes through your brain should be truth and not what should I do? First John two, three through five. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. I think I already read that. Yeah, I did. Okay, so spiritual arrogance. Yah, with, Yah, with Yahweh, there will be no excuses um, when it comes to this stuff. So this is what Jason was talking about. Like, yeah, Jesus knows my heart. He does. Yahweh knows your heart as well. And when Yahweh tells you to do something and you disobey him, he's not going to forget that on the day of judgment. Everything you're doing is being written down by a particular scribe with a pen. This scribe has been recording everything from the first incursion of the angels and everything since the beginning of time. Men were never supposed to learn how to write. If you've noticed, the English language is evil. It's all spells. Everything that has to do with everything that we're involved in, in every language, usually is pretty wicked. Except for the original languages, which is why they were written in a way where they represented a picture and they meant an actual word or a letter. It's much different than the alphabet that we have oh that's good i'm glad to hear that revelation 20 12 and i saw the dead small and great standing before yahweh and the books were opened and another book was opened which was the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books malachi 3 13 your words have been harsh against me says yahweh Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve Yahweh. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances and we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? All through scripture you see this continually. It's nonstop. You see that Yahweh says, 
For I have said that you should turn back, but we have said we will not hear your words. When Jeremiah the prophet was telling them what Yahweh told him. Turn back. Turn back. Yahweh is so merciful. 120 prophets, at least, sent to Israel of old. Turn back. Turn back. Please, turn back. Yahweh's arm is still outstretched. Turn back. He still loves you. Turn back. Even though you're playing the harlot, turn back. But then eventually, eventually we get to the book of uh, Isaiah, and boom, there is the letter of divorcement, which Yeshua nailed to the cross so that we could be reunited with the Father again. Man, this breaks my heart. It really does, guys. And I know that a lot of you are getting it, but I know that some are just, some people hear this and they seethe and it saddens me. Matthew 24, 4. And Yeshua answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. When he's talking to his disciples, Matthew 24 breaks down exactly verbatim what takes place in Revelation chapter 6. If, you, if, if I have time, we'll go through that, but I want to finish this up. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they may be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, the only church that was promised that this would not fall on was the church of Philadelphia. They will be kept from the hour that will fall, this strong delusion. Well, not necessarily a strong delusion, but this um, hour of temptation that will fall upon the whole earth. The people that are living like the Church of Philadelphia will be the people that will be spared from that. I've got a whole teaching on that on my YouTube channel if you want to go into the link, but I think it's one of the older videos that are on there. It's uh, Revelation 1 through 10. Daniel eleven thirty one 31 through 33. And forces shall be mustered by him that they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. This is also spoken about in Matthew 24. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days shall they fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now, there's a lot that we can break down here, but let's just say this. Satan, Daniel prophesied that Satan would set himself up in the holy place, the church. The link to my YouTube is in my bio. It's called the Sword of Israel. Daniel prophesied that Satan would set himself up on the throne of God, on God, of God proclaiming to be God. So let me tell you this. If you attend a church, he's already sitting there preaching to you in the name of Jesus Christ. The name Jesus Christ is not the name that was given to our Messiah. People will go as far as to say, well, the name Jesus Christ is just a transliteration of the name Yeshua HaMashiach. No, it's not. If I say GG Ping or GG Ping in America, is that change in any other country? Do you say it any other way? Vladimir Putin, would you say that any other way in any other country? My name is Michael. It's a slight change if I go to Germany, it would be Mikhail, but it's still the same thing, right? So let me ask you this. Satan being more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And then the prophecy says that he'll set himself up, set, set himself up on the throne of God. This is the abomination of desolation. When we see Satan standing there in the temple, what temple? Because the third temple is not built by human hands. So the temple that Yeshua was talking about is your body. The temple, the body, is, the abom is where the abomination of desolation will take place, just like it did in the days of Noah, where they corrupted the DNA, the fallen, right? So if you understand the corruption and what took place, the first incursion in the garden, the second incursion in Genesis 6-4, you'll understand that they were manipulating the DNA of both man and beast. And then you'll understand that they're doing the same thing now because when that took place in Genesis chapter 6, the 70 generations that those angels were bound, they've been let loose. And guess what? All of a the sudden, there's been a huge increase in technology. All of a the sudden, they're tampering with DNA again. 
go to Moderna's website and study the pages on there and tell me if you don't read it where it says they call their jab the software of life. What does a vaccine have anything to do with being software for your body? Sound familiar? This is spoken about in scripture where man and machine would merge and become one. But it's not what most people think. The book of Daniel and the the feet being destroyed, the, mire, the, the clay mixing with iron, that's not talking about that. That's actually talking about two seeds, two nations of people mixing, and it becoming known who those two nations are, which has been hidden since Genesis chapter 3. It's the reason why Cain was marked. Let's put it that way. In Genesis chapter 4, it explains to you that Cain was marked, lest anyone finding him should kill him. But Cain and Abel were both young men. And if Adam and Eve were given that instruction that no one was to, to, cut, to touch Cain, lest they would take judgment on them sevenfold, who else was on the earth that Cain would run into? And why did, the, or why did Yahweh have to change the way that Cain looked? in order for him to go out into the world and not be murdered. And where did Cain find his wife? And then explain to me why Yahweh drove out man, woman, and child from all of these places and had no mercy on them because they were not created by the Most High. They were created by the fallen. When you start understanding where the giants came from and the fact that they hide giants from us, the fact that David fought giants, all of these stories that people don't believe that are all written in scripture. I'll say this again. If you don't believe me, open your Bible and go to Leviticus chapter 16. Go down to verse 7 and 8 and you'll see the word goat and scapegoat. They were atoning for their sin, for mixing seed with the fallen. And why they were having to do that was for their family's sake. So as they were doing that, if you look up the name scapegoat in Hebrew, it'll shock you. All of the sin that was ascribed to the angels that made their pact on the top of Mount Hermon was ascribed to an angel called Azazel or Azazel. Guess what the name scapegoat in Hebrew means? Azazel. And guess what the entire Old Testament is about the bloodlines chasing out all of these Og of Bashan, King of Bashan, the Canaanites, the Hivites, all of these ites, they were all the different offsprings of these different giants or these different angels who came down and bore giants. So again, when you go back and you study these things, you'll understand very quickly where they came from. But if you don't believe me, just go and look it up and see, test it. And then you'll find out very quickly that there's much, much more meat in the Old Testament than people realize. And then the Old Testament will start making sense to you. You'll start to understand there's a reason why the bloodlines are left there. There's a reason why Esau became the father of the Edomites. There's a reason why all of that stuff is happening again now. All right, so let's continue on. Uh, I forgot where I left off here. Dan I think it was Daniel's last. Yeah, Daniel. Uh, for this reason, the true followers of the Messiah and Yahweh uh, will be turned over to the wicked. So this is when we were reading earlier out of Revelation where it said um, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed and those that keep the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of the Messiah. It will be the true church, the people that understand the word of God that will be persecuted by Satan. So Christians that are going to church and all of that, if you don't believe the truth that th that's in the word of God, you have nothing to worry about. Satan's not coming after you. He'll convince you that an alien invasion will happen, or he'll convince you that these demons that are let free, that are roaming the earth and the fallen, because it's been 70 generations, he'll have you convinced on the day of Armageddon that you'll be fighting against some foreign invader when it's actually the Messiah coming back. That's how strong of a delusion people will be placed under. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, I already read that. That's Israel becoming a nation. Are we still teaching one another to know Yahweh? Well, uh, Hebrews 8.12, or, or we'll start at 8.10, but it's literally telling you the same thing we read in Jeremiah 31 about the new covenant. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Revelation 21, 1 through 4. So because believers um, don't study and they don't believe the word of God, we see all the things that take place as a result of that. People become lovers of themselves, blasphemers. Uh, they treat their parents with disrespect. Um, and you're going to see that the wickedness of mankind is going to multiply at a pretty rapid rate here pretty soon. Um, we, we got a little bit of a glimpse of it during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but I'll tell you this, that a lot of the stuff that was taking place during the pandemic, as far as prophecy goes, went right over people's heads. It tells us that these great merchants of the earth, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, all of these mighty men of the earth, these rich men, they'll be riding in on the shoulders of the Philistines. The Philistines are the people that are coming forward that are claiming that they're the nation of Israel. So understand that when I talk about the seed war in the beginning of scripture, it's going to happen again. It's happening now. Abraham's promise was made to him and he was a sojourner in a strange land, meaning everyone around him didn't look like he looked. And he was outnumbered at that time. Remember when the sons of Jacob slew uh, the Hivite prince, Shechem and, um, I can't think of the other, Hamar, Hamar and Shechem. They were giants. They were descendants from giants, and they raped, defiled Dina, their sister. So they got them to get circumcised, and on the third day they went in and slew all the men. This is no different than what's taking place now, but just remember that promise. Remember when Jacob came back, he said, what have you done? We're sojourners in this land. They're going to kill us once they find out what you did. But guess what? Yahweh made a promise that that seed, that Israel would become more than all of the stars in the sky if they could count them, if he could count them, or more of all of the sand in the sea, right? Which happened. If you look at since then up until now, but now Israel is starting to diminish. We're becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. This is why the prophets tell us that Jacob would be small, but he'll be a mighty army, but small. So for the first three and a half years, we'll have to be smart about how we move and how we walk. But after that three and a half years, the second measure of the Spirit will be poured out. And then five will chase ten, ten will chase twenty, so on and so forth. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the point. That means Israel, the roles will reverse. Correction starts in the house of the Most High. So he sends this army from the north. Now, I'm going to share with you... Revelation 9 is where this locust army comes from. They come out of the pit, and they enter into a certain nation of people. I'm going to give you some places to look, and I'm going to give you a pointer that you should be looking for when you're reading through prophecy. Psalms 72, 16. There will be an abundance of grain on the earth, on top of the mountains. It is fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of this city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. Now, Lebanon, according to the prophets, it says, unlike the other nations, is not sufficient to burn. Yahweh destroyed or cleansed to baptize the earth the first time by water. The second time will be by fire. But it says that Lebanon, if you look up the word Lebanon, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn like the other nations, and the other nations are considered as spit or spittle. Yahweh. That's not my words, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you what prophecy says. Uh, but it also speaks about, the prophets speak about all flesh being as grass. Remember in Revelation where the angels are sent out to destroy, but it says not to harm any green tree or any green grass until the seal of the living God is put on their foreheads. Psalm 78, 46. He also gave their crops, the caterpillar and the labor to the locust. When you're reading caterpillar, locust, uh, paler worm, all of this stuff, this is speaking of this locust army. And when these prophets are speaking about these things, they're speaking about them in a prophetic language that you have to understand if you want to understand what takes place in Revelation chapter 9. It says, And you shall plunder and shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running and fro of the locust he shall run upon them. So let's get a little deeper. Isaiah 40, verse 6. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? 
all flesh is grass, and the loveliness is the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Now, here's where this army comes into place. Isaiah 51, 79. I'm going to give you a couple different prophecies, and I'm going to let you un uh, unlock and decide how you want to view this and why the Messiah says, Behold, I give you power to tread on snakes and serpents and scorpions, right? Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people, in your heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like the wool. But my righteousness will be forever in my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O army of Yahweh. Awake in the ancient days, in the generation of old. You are not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Question mark. Isaiah 51, 12. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of man who will die and the son of man who will be made like grass? So that's just the beginning now. Now we're going to start getting into a little bit more of the meat of what I'm talking about here. Joel 228 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is the second measure of the spirit that I'm talking about. Mid-tribulation. Pay attention. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heaven and the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in my Mount Zion, not to be confused with Zion, this, this is Zion with a Z, not with an S, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, we've gone through this before. Revelation makes it very clear. Only a remnant shall be saved. So this aligns with Revelation 6.12. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Acts 2.20. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, listen very, very closely. Ezekiel twenty forty six through 48 Son of man, set your face towards the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south. And say to the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched in all faces from the south and the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, and it shall not be quenched. Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, riding on horses, a great company, a mighty army. Now what do we read in uh, Revelation 9? These locust army that are riding on horses, right? They're not, they're not, they don't look like locusts. They're not they're not going to be bugs flying around. These are nations of people with evil spirits in them once Satan opens up the pit and lets his children out. Proverbs 25, 23. The north wind brings forth rain and backbiting tongue and angry continents. Remember, Yahweh is sending this nor northern army to correct Israel. Jacob, who's small, the remnant. Um, let's see. Jeremiah 6, 23 Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people comes from the north country. A great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. They will lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voices roar like the sea, and they ride on horses as men set in array against you, O daughter of Zion. Her noise shall be heard like a serpent. For they shall march with an army and come against her with axes like those who chop wood. 
They shall cut down her forest, saith the Lord, though it can be it cannot be searched, because they are innum- innumerable and more numerous than the grasshoppers. The daughter of Egypt shall be ashamed. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. This is just a small amount of stuff that we're talking about here. This is a, another part of it in Amos. It's just worded differently. Amos 7, 1 through 3. Thus saith the Lord God, who showed me, Behold, he formed the locust worms in the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was a late crop after the king's mowings. And it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive me, I pray, O that Jacob might stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, saith Yahweh. So Yahweh is going to have mercy on Jacob. But only a remnant. Only those that are keeping the will of the Father. The will of the Father, the commandments, and the testimony of his son, Yeshua. Micah 5, 7. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers of gra- on the grass, that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. Uh, this is Nahum 3.15. There the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you off, it will eat you up like the locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. So again, I hope you guys are getting this. The locust, the paler worm, the canker worm, uh, all of these uh, green things, like in Revelation nine four. Then we were command. Then we were. Uh, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The prophets tell us the story of the book of Revelation, but without. The spirit of prophecy, which is the Messiah, you cannot understand or will you ever decipher the book of Revelation. This is my point in showing you what I'm showing you. This northern army, which I could go on and on and on and on about, which I'm not going to do because, again, if I go too far into this, then I'm spoon feeding everyone. And I want you guys to go understand what all of this stuff means. I'll take you to Revelation 9 and I'll show you. A few things there that are helpful, but at the same time, uh, I have to be cautious about what I say and how I say it. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We know who this is. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the pit the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as scorpions of the earth have power. So this is why the Messiah is telling you he gives you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, nor any green thing, nor any green tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented for five months. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, if you read on, it sounds like they're bugs, but it's just telling you in a prophetic language how they're going to be riding on horses and how they're going to have power to hurt men. And then the angels that are let loose out of the river Euphrates and all of the chaos that's going to cause. So again, if angels can't sin... Explain to me why they can't return to their first state. Um, there's a lot in this this book of Revelation, um, but there's one that I really want to bring to your attention for those of you that believe in a trinity, because I covered this earlier. This is uh, Revelation 8. And when I heard he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of a half hour, and I saw seven angels which stood before Yahweh. These seven angels are the seven angels that Yeshua holds in his hand in Revelation chapter 1. And to them were given the seven trumpets. So, do these angels work when Yahweh speaks? Do angels build things and make things? Of course they do. Yeshua, all things were made by him, for him, and through him. Yahweh is in a realm that we cannot behold. If Yahweh came to this earth, we would all die. I can guarantee you that just based on the scriptures that I've studied and the things that you guys probably already know. We can't behold him. 
That's why he sent his son. This is why we have messengers. This is why we have a mediator and a high priest. These seven angels, Michael, Gabriel, Ga uh, uh, Raphael, all these angels that surround the throne that Ezekiel sees, all of these angels are going to play their part in Revelation. The 144,000 are the hail mixed with fire and blood that are cast into the earth that destroy a third of man. The rock that's not cut from human hands, the church, the remnant, will be cast into the earth and will destroy a third of mankind. Those that don't keep the will of the Father and the testimony of the Messiah. That's what the prophets teach us. But listen very closely. And I saw the seven angels which stood before Yahweh, and it was given to them seven trumpets. But another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints on, up upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Who offers our prayers up unto Yahweh? Who's our mediator to Yahweh? Is Yeshua the Son of God, or is Yeshua God? Because according to prophecy, and according to the prophecy of the Messiah, which is the book of Revelation, it makes it very clear that this angel that ascends out of the east to the west, according to Matthew 24, is a very specific angel that was anointed above his fellows with the oil of gladness in Hebrews chapter 1. So if we go back to Matthew 24, it tells us very clearly what we just read. And then I'll go and I'll show you the four winds and the two witnesses in Ezekiel. So it says here uh, in Matthew 24 that for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, if we read in Revelation, it tells us that an angel comes from the east the same exact way. And what are they coming to do? They're coming to seal the, he the foreheads of those men to gather his elect. It says, 31, And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. And it says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree, which is important to know. We've gone over this. This takes you all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. This is your foundation. But it also goes on to say in uh Verse 37, But as in the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So we went over what were taking place in the days of Noah. I have videos on that. The link is in the bio. Go back and study these things. But I want to show you guys something really quickly. If you go back to Ezekiel 9, this is how important it is to understand prophecy. Now, we just saw that there will be uh, the four winds that are going to be sent, these four angels that are going to be sent to collect those that are scattered. But we're also told that there will be two witnesses that will come as well. This is Ezekiel 9. This is prophecy about that day. He cried also in my ear with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every man in his hand with a destroying weapon. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man in his hand a slaughter weapon. And one of the men among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. Hmm, who do we know that's the man with the writer's inkhorn by his side, according to the book of Enoch? Who is the man that walked with God, that was so pleasing to God that he didn't taste death? Enoch. Who is the second man? Elijah. So we have six men here with slaughter weapons that are standing at the higher gate. We have the four winds, the four angels that are being sent, and we have Enoch and Elijah. And the glory of Yahweh of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was there in the threshold of the house, and he called unto the man clothed with linen, with, had, who had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations done in the midst thereof, those that keep the commandments of the Most High and the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. And to the others he said, In mine hearing, go after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old, young, both maids, little children and women, 
but come not near any man upon whom the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Where does correction start? At the house of the Most High. This is why the northern army is sent to correct us for three and a half years. But then the roles are reversed. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And he went forth and slew the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, I was left and fell upon my face. And I cried and said, O oh, Lord God, will thy destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of blood, and the city is full of perverseness. For they say that the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord, has see, and the Lord seeth not. As for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. I'm reading right out of the KJV. So, that just gave us insight on what takes place with the four winds, which Ezekiel sees, these four angels that surround the throne of God, which are spoken about, Michael being one of them. When Michael the Restrainer, who is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is removed, chaos will ensue because Michael is over chaos in the better part of mankind. So, Michael is one of the angels who surround the throne of God. And when you read Ezekiel chapter 1, you see that Ezekiel sees this great giant throne coming down from as far as he can see. It's, it's massive, yet people cannot wrap their head around the fact that there were giants in the land that were bigger than cedar trees. When the disciples were asked to have their spiritual eyes opened, they saw giants and it terrified them. Giant angels. Yahweh likens this place this planet that we're on as his footstool anytime any of these prophets have ever seen a vision of the throne it is massive and the creatures or the angels that are on the four corners of this throne are also massive and dreadful and what they do their wings are like the wings that are on top of the ark of the covenant their top wings all surround God's throne and then their bottom wings cover their body but they have four faces each one of their faces depending on what the throne is coming for if you see the face of a man Yahweh's coming to bring a message if it's the face of an animal a certain type of animal there's a different reason why the throne's coming down this is why we have to have the prophets folks this is why we have to study prophecy and understand prophecy because without it Everything else that you read, even in the New Testament, is just speculation in your opinion. It's not what the Word of God says. And if you can't establish what, what one of these prophets is saying in every single prophecy, then you know something's off. And it's not something with the Scripture that's off, it's your understanding that's off. And again, this is why I tell people, we don't give opinions. We go by what Scripture tells us. If you follow what the prophets tell you, and what you read, I'll let you read Ezekiel chapter 1, and you can come to the conclusion of who the four winds are. But Revelation, by the time you get to study all the prophecies and you get to the book of Revelation, you don't have to listen to pastor so-and-so or this person who is a uh, uh, been studying scripture for eight years and has been indoctrinated with the ways of the church. You can study and have Yahweh be your teacher. And then you can stop being afraid of the books that were once part of the Bible that they removed. And stop placing your trust in a Roman Catholic book. The KJV has not been tested and tried by fire seven times. It is not the inspired word of God. There is no Bible on the planet that we know of that has not been altered. Because Yahweh himself tells us nearly eight times that scripture would be changed by the hands of men. So why are we going to say that it's not? Why would we say that it's not been fouled up? It has been. Does Yahweh, does Yeshua say in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? No. That is not what the line of the tribe of Judah says. 
He says, add iniquity to their iniquity. Blot them out of the book of the living. Let their table become a snare. Darken their eyes. The people that put Yeshua on the cross knew exactly what they were doing. They were the seeds of Satan, the scribes and Pharisees, you brood of vipers. Let me translate that in Hebrew. You serpent seed. That's exactly what we're up against. That's exactly what the scripture is talking about. There are those that will choose to do good and those that will choose to do evil, just like in Leviticus. Let's go back and read the atonement for Israel in Leviticus 16. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Look up the word goat in Hebrew. It means devil. That's the atonement for mixing with the fallen, the first incursion. One lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. Azazel, or Azazel, however you want to say his name. That's what scapegoat means in Hebrew. The whole Old Testament, literally all of the bloodlines that are in this book, are telling you that this is who they were driving out. Yahweh is not a God that destroys man, woman, and child for no reason. If he didn't create them, this is why they were being destroyed. Why? Because they, the angels who made their own children out of the will of the Most High, were destroying the earth. They came against Yahweh, not the other way around. So if you go through, I promise you, if you go look at the bloodlines, you'll see for yourself. And don't be afraid of things like, uh, look, we, we already know what uh, Genesis chapter 6 says. Let's read Enoch chapter 7 verse 1. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for themselves one, and they began to go into them and defile themselves with them. They taught them charms and enchantments and cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose heights were three thousand ells, who consumed all the accusations of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against the birds and the beasts and the reptiles and the fish, and to devour one another's flesh and to drink the blood. The earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. I said this the other day. When Cain kills Abel, Cain's blood or Abel's blood cries out from the ground. The earth cried out and Yahweh said, what have you done? The earth is constantly bearing witness against what we say, what we do. This is why we're given specific instructions on how to baptize in living water, the water having to be a certain temperature because it testifies against what you're doing. You're making an oath with the creator of the world. So if you're going if you're going to do that, this is why Yahweh says it has to be done in a certain manner. So again, this is why Yahweh says in Genesis 6, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for his year shall be 120. From that day forth, they had 120 years before the flood came. And Yahweh baptized the earth and rid the earth of evil because they were devouring mankind and drinking the blood. We are forbidden to drink blood because the spirit lives in the blood. This is why we're seeing what we're seeing taking place today in Hollywood and the music industry. It's no secret. They're doing the same thing because they're free. They were bound for 70 generations. They're not anymore. Not to mention the ones that are still have been walking the earth. The demons, the offspring of the Nephilim, the Nephilim that died, became trapped on the earth and they're known as spirits. Evil spirits. Demons. There's a difference between them and the angels. So when I hear people saying, demons can't have sex with man, no kidding. No one ever said they did. It says the angels who left their first estate and took on human flesh, just like Satan does, he can transform himself into an angel of light. And scripture tells us, be careful how you treat people because you could be entertaining an angel unawares. The Messiah came here in flesh. So again, we, we've got to back up off of what we think we understand about scripture and stop being afraid of reading a book when we're not afraid to go watch filthy garbage movies from Hollywood by these perverts who are doing exactly what we're reading, drinking blood selling other people's children. It's disgusting. 
Enoch chapter 22, And he answered me, saying, This is the spirit which went forth from Abel, who his brother Cain slew, and he makes his suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. Will the seed of the Canaanites be destroyed? Absolutely, according to your 66 book canon that everybody loves so much, it tells you in that 66 book canon that none of them shall enter into the congregation of the, of the Most High. None of them. So again, if you go through the genealogy of Adam, you'll get all the way down to the seventh from Adam, which was Enoch. Enoch just happened to be a very special person who's mentioned very few times. Then there were giants in the, in the land before and after. We see Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? Go through the bloodlines and see who gets cursed for what and out of those three children. People keep telling me that Noah wasn't raped. Noah was raped. If you study scripture and you understand what it means to uncover someone's nakedness, this is the reason why Noah cursed him. And this is the reason why it happened to begin with. Because the woman, the three women that were not part of Noah's family that were allowed on the ark, one of them was carrying one of the chromosomes from the offspring of one of these giants, one of these ites. Remember, all the way up until Joshua in the scriptures, they were chasing out giants from the land of Og, the Og of Bashan, the giants, the offspring. Do you remember David and Goliath? David walked down by the brook and picked up five smooth stones, not because he thought he was going to miss with Goliath, but because Goliath had four other brothers who were also giants. And David was ready to walk out onto the battlefield wearing the armor of the Most High, and he was ready to slay all five of them because he trusted in the God that he served, and he knew who stood behind him. Again, I've said this before, and I keep saying it again. If you think Yahweh is some evil, twisted God that's double-minded, that goes through and starts just allowing bad things to happen to anyone, that's not the case. They were allowed... Yahweh is so merciful that he allowed the offspring of the fallen to take over the land of Canaan, the promised land, which is in Africa, not Israel, south of the rivers of Cush. Okay? Genesis 15, it tells you all of the descendants of the giants from where the great river Euphrates was, right? And it goes all the way through to the Rephaim, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, all of these ites on all of the offspring of the giants. And then you get to Genesis 6, 15, and you see one of the first sons, or the first son that Abraham has before he makes covenant with Yahweh, he has a son named Ishmael through his handmaiden, Hagar. Guess who the descendants of Ishmael are? Muslims. If you read it, when Yeshua approaches Hagar, he tells her, go back to Sarah, hearken to her voice, I will make your son a strong nation and I will give him 11 princes. It's not, it's not rocket science. It just takes a little bit of study. That's all. You just have to be willing to go through this stuff and study it. This is why it says that her descendant Ishmael would butt heads with us, believers in Yahweh's word. They believe their God, we believe ours. Ishmael, when he was older in the book of Jasher, or Yash, or however you want to say it, was holding a bow and arrow up and was aiming it at Isaac. This is why Sarah gets upset and says, nope, I want them out now. I want them out of the house now. There's a reason for all of this stuff. And Jasher, if you really want to know Genesis really well and all the ins and outs of what took place in Genesis, read the book of Jasher. I guarantee you, you've watched movies that are way worse. I guarantee you, you've listened to music that's way filthier. When that is inspired... That's an inspired word because it's mentioned in the 66 book canon. And then people try to lie and twist and manipulate and say that's not what it says. It says in, in the 66 book canon, did you, have you not heard in the book of uh, Jasher? It, Enoch is mentioned over and over and over again. The Messiah mentions Enoch nearly 20 times alone. If we cannot wrap our heads around the bigger picture of this, which again, I'm not saying if you can't understand all the stuff that took place and you don't care about all the bloodlines, that's fine. But what I am saying is there's much more to the scriptures than people think. And this is the reason why you have pastors telling you the Old Testament's not for us. Yes, it is. 
The Old Testament is your foundation. It's your rock. It is the Messiah. The whole book is telling you about the Messiah. The Messiah was with Yahweh from the beginning, and then when mankind was created, he came down and Yahweh spoke through him in the burning bush. He spoke to him through Joshua by agency. Let's cover agency really quickly while I have time. All right, so let's see. Here's, here's part of the story of Hagar. The angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said to her, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence came thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Listen to this. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. Do you think that's the Messiah speaking? Because I don't know of any angels who can multiply anyone's seed. This is Yahweh speaking through his son Yeshua. This is why Yeshua said, Before Abraham was, I am. Ego I me. I existed. Simple, simply put. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. Sound familiar? That's just one. We've already gone over Genesis 18, 1, and Genesis 19, and why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed and how Lot was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, let's see. This is this. Uh, you guys can read Genesis 21, 9 through 21. That tells you why Sarah wanted him out of the house. Um, but as we get a little bit further down here, I want to go over uh, the story of Moses and everything that took place. So, Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and led the flock to the backside of the desert. And it came to the mountain of God, even at Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and looked, and behold, and the bush burned with fire, and the bush was consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, Yahweh called unto him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am, said Moses. And he said, draw not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Why? Because Yahweh's speaking directly through his son, Yeshua. The ground doesn't get much holier than that. Through the Spirit, by the way. All three are right there at the same time. So, this is the first time we see an angel telling someone to take their sandals off because they're standing on holy ground. The second time we see this is with the book of, in the book of Joshua. But let me go a little further with this. Joshua 5, 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Is it okay for us to worship angels? Don't think so. Didn't John do this in the book of Revelation? with a certain angel. He fell on his face and worshiped and what did, did God say, depart from me, you wicked servant. Don't you dare fall before my angels and worship them. The angel said, get up, don't do that. I too am your fellow servant. I too keep the testimony and commandments of God. And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of Yahweh, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face and onto the earth to worship him and the servant. And the captain of the Lord of hosts said unto Joshua, Loosen thy shoe from off thy foot, from the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, 
Who is the captain of the Lord of hosts? Let's, let's look at Revelation. Now that we've looked at prophets, the prophecies, look at, let's look at Revelation and find out. Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true in righteousness. He doeth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. Why? Because he's the king of kings. And he had a name that was written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Whose blood was that? We'll find out in a second. And the armies which are in heaven followed upon him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, that he should smite the nations and shall rule over them with a rod of iron. Who's the rod of iron? The 144,000, the new priesthood during the thousand-year millennial reign. This will be the people that will be teaching the remnant the laws of Yahweh, cleaning them up, presenting them to Yahweh after the thousand-year reign is over. He treadeth the winepress uh, the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I told you guys the divorce letter is in Isaiah chapter 63. But it's not just anybody he's trampling on in Isaiah chapter 63. It's the seed of Satan he's trampling on in Isaiah 63. Listen to this very closely. Who is this that cometh from Edom with his dyed garments from Basra? Look up that. Look that up. Look into the who's, who's in Edom. Who's the father of the Edomites? Esau. The one who mixed seed with the fallen or the offspring, the Canaanite and the Hivites and all of those. And dyed his, gar and dyed his garments coming out of Basra that is in his glorious apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and the blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all of my raiment. For the day of vengeance is, my, is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. I wouldn't want to be there. And you can continue on reading. It gets pretty insane. But there will be blood up to the horse's bridles. This is the, the, the great wedding feast where all of these nations are going to come and feed. This is the cage of every foul spirit. This is all of the, the parable of the sower, all of the thorns and thistles and the different animals that are coming up, eating the Torah, eating the good seed, because it's not been planted on good ground. This teaching that Jason did, go to Jason's channel, it's his name, go watch that teaching of the parable of the sower. And then all of these prophets that are speaking about thorns and thistles, even all the way back to Genesis, what did Yahweh say? Thorns and thistles shall it bring from the work of your hands, the sweat of your brow. The thorns and thistles were already on the earth. These, these animals that are being named, the Canaanite woman that was called a dog, all of these different nations have names in scripture. They're likened to animals. Enoch chapter 89 goes into great detail from beginning to end about all of these different animals and who they are and how everything will take place during the end days. Not my opinion, Go through it and read it and understand it. But this is why we have to study prophecy. Because prophets tell us the story of what's taking place in, in uh, Revelation. He's trampling the wine press here. This takes place in Revelation as well. As a matter of fact, we'll go there really quickly and we'll see that it's the cage of every uh, unfoul beast. And uh, we see that this angel comes with a sickle to reap the, the earth is ready to be reaped, right? And he comes with a sickle and reaps the earth. Um, so, uh, just quick side note here. Revelation 12 talks about um, when Satan comes to attack us. It says, and the dragon was saw that the 
uh, that he was cast out onto the earth, Revelation 9. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, the church. And to the woman were given two wings as a great eagle, Enoch and Elijah, that she might fly into, into the wilderness, the promised land, the land of Canaan, into her place where she shall be nourished for a time, a time and a half of times, three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out from his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that it might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and opened her mouth to swallow up the flood which the dragon cast out of her mouth. Who is being prosecuted? Those that keep the commandments of the Most High and the testimony of his son Yeshua. I keep saying it. I sound like a broken record. I really want people to get it. This right here is telling us what's happening. The two prophets will take us to this highway that no one else will be able to enter on. No one else that's unrighteous will be able to enter into this highway. The highway will be the, the way in which all of the remnant will be able to get to the land of Canaan. And we will be kept in the promised land for three and a half, the three and a half remaining years in safety. This is when the deserts open up and water starts pouring out of them and flowers start to flourish and in dead lands where there's nothing happening. God will open up beautiful places again for us. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So we each each page of Revelation, I would strongly recommend going back uh, into the link in my bio. If you're interested in the book of Revelation, go and watch the Revelation series that I did. That's Revelation chapter 1 through 10. Um, it explains through the prophets all of the different things that are taking place. Each page in Revelation is a different angle. The same things are happening. The same story is playing out. It's just different angles that are being given and different pieces that you have to put together to understand what's happening. Like, for instance, we just read the two prophets are coming to carry this woman, the church, the remnant away and to hide them for three and a half years. Uh, here it is. Here is the patience of the saints. They that are the ones that keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the faith of Yeshua. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow them. And he looked and beheld a white cloud and upon the cloud one that sat upon like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him and that sat on the cloud, and said, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come, for thee to reap the harvest of the earth, for it is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came from the temple, which was in heaven also having a sharp sickle and another angel came from the altar which had the power of fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle now if you want to know who all these angels are all you need to do is read or go watch our series on enoch it explains which each one of these angels have power over these are the seven angels of yahweh uh, the YouTube link is in my bio. It's sort of Israel is the name, but the, it's easier just to go into my bio and just click on the YouTube link. It'll take you right to the page. Um, let's see. And, and the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. We just read that in Isaiah chapter 63. And the wine press was trodden with the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even up to the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So again, this to me, I could literally, I wish I had the time to sit here and walk back and forth, back and forth through the prophets and into the New Testament, back to the Old Testament, to prove to you that if you think all of your knowledge is in the New Testament, you are lost. If you've never studied the Old Testament and you don't know prophecy, and you believe only in the letters of Paul, you are the most lost person on the earth. You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I can tell you that right now. Because you don't know that you're to keep God's commandments. Because you believe that Paul is preaching a different gospel. That makes Paul a false prophet. That makes our Messiah a liar. And I don't like people that preach that kind of garbage. When you tell me the KJV is the inspired word of God, then explain to me why they changed it. 
Why did they say that the Messiah said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Why don't we go back to the Old Testament, to the prophets? Let's see what King David had to say about this circumstance because the Messiah said out of his own mouth, everything that was written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms concerning him. So let's read because the whole story of our Messiah is told through King David's mouth, through the book of Psalms. Go listen to it. It's beautiful. Sometimes you can hear it's talking about King David, and other times you'll hear it's talking about the Messiah, how they cast lots for his raiment. This is about him being hung on the cross, though. And then I'll show you Jeremiah 8.8, 8, where it says, How can we say that we're wise when the scribe of the lying pen is at work, changing the words of God to confuse the children of the Most High? Not today, not on my watch, Satan. Genesis, uh, this is Psalm 69, uh, verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This didn't happen to King David. Let their table become a snare before them. That which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy, wrath, thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. Now listen very closely if you think this is King David. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to grief of those whom thou hast wounded. This is speaking of the Most High and his Son. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Does that sound like Father, forgive them? And then you tell me that the KJV is the inspired word of God. All scripture has been altered. You can, you can go buy two different versions of the Septuagint and you can go read Isaiah 9.6. Watch this. I want you to see where Trinitarians get their doctrine from because... And again, if you're a Trinitarian, forgive me. I'm not attacking you. I am attacking, however, the fact that the people from the Council of Nicaea forward changed uh, changed the scripture so that this uh, lie would continue on. First, I'm going to read Isaiah 9-6 out of the KJV. The Septuagint, if you go read from the Septuagint, it's where all of these other books are translated from. Some will say the Masoretic text, depending on whether you believe in Trini the Trinity doctrine or not. Um, where was I at? Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6. Yeah. All right, so let me read from the KJV first, because this is where people say, no, see, he's God. For a child, for, a, uh, for unto us a child is born and a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called the Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be peace, and there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice, from henceforth forever and ever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, let's go back to where this originally comes from and read it. This is why I get upset with the Trinitarian doctrine. For a child is born to us and a son is given to us whose government is upon his shoulder. His name shall be called the messenger of the great council. For I will bring peace unto the princes and health to him. His government shall be great and his peace there shall be no end. It shall be upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to be established and to support it with judgment and righteousness from henceforth and forever. The seal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Nowhere in the Septuagint does it mention anything about Yeshua being called God at all. No mention, not even once. But yet, the KJV is the infallible word of God. It calls him the mighty God, the everlasting Father. How deceiving is Satan. Again, I'm not changing anything. I'm re I, The whole time we've been studying, literally, I've been studying out of the KJV, 
And prior to that, when I was reading from uh, notes and stuff that I have in here that I've transferred from the New Living or the revised vision of the Tree of Life version, which is just using original names and stuff like that, I read from that because I want to know the original names of everything, all of the people that were in Scripture, not just the Messiah, not just Yeshua. And I have the Sefer, I have the Scriptures, I have the Tanakh, I have all of these different books so that I can study to show myself approved. The Septuagint, the, inter, the Interlinear, all of these books are how we are to study to find truth. But let me read to you something now. This is just one of many, but this is the most familiar that people have read over and over again. This is Jeremiah 8.8. 8. This is, again, guys, listen to me. When I say we have to study to show ourselves approved, that's not my opinion. That's what Yahweh told us to do. How do we say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord and the wisdom is in them. And what wisdom is in them? Sorry. Therefore I will give their wives unto others in their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the, from everyone from the least even to the greatest to give uh, to covet, covet, covetousness from the prophet even unto the priest. Every one dealeth falsely. So again, if Yahweh says the text would be changed. Who are we to say that one version of the Bible that comes from the Roman Catholic Church? Let me repeat that. The Roman Catholic Church. Why do we say that's the infallible word of God? If you go back and you read these from the Septuagint, it'll shock you. Literally, the stuff that you read, it'll shock you. It's well known that all throughout the Old Testament, the word, word, when it's referring to the word of God, has always been Torah. But we get to the New Testament in John 1.1, 1, 1, one of the most divinity-driven books that were written, and it starts off with the word was with God and the word was God. That word, because it was written in Greek instead of its original language, which should have been in Hebrew, again, everything that happens in this Bible happens for particular reasons. For one, the Messiah will always be a stumbling block to a certain group of people. Then Paul will always be a stumbling block to a certain group of people. Then you have the Most High allowing the scribe of the lying pen to change the word of God. Why? Because God wants people to chase after him. Because we have chased after other gods relentlessly. And God wants to know who truly loves him. This is why we study to show ourselves approved. Not so we can use fancy words. Not so we can one-up somebody. I could care less about arguing with people that think that they're wise in their own mind. I care about what Yahweh says. If Yahweh tells me to go study and show myself approved, show myself approved that's what I'm going to go do. If Yahweh says, keep my feasts and don't do as the pagans do, I'm not celebrating Christmas. I don't give a crap who does it. If Jeremiah talks about the pagans cutting down a tree and decking it with gold and silver and fastening it with a nail to hold it up and it's a tree that cannot speak, why would I celebrate that? We were given feast by Yahweh to keep and half of believers today or more can't even keep the Sabbath day holy. The Roman Catholic Church openly came out and said they changed the Sabbath from Friday to sundown from Saturday to sundown, which is the original seventh day Sabbath, to Sunday. Why? Because they worship sun gods, Nimrod. The 25th is Nimrod's birthday. Nine months prior to that was Easter. Ishtar, Nimrod's mother, who was beautiful, who he married and had intercourse with, they would have big orgies. Then they would have children, and the children that were born from them orgies, they would sacrifice on Nimrod's birthday, the 24th. And yet we want to keep Christmas on the 25th. It's time to wake up, guys. Time's very, very short, and the deception is so deep, it's disgusting. When you see the things that go on around you in this world, it will blow your mind. No, I would recommend if... if oh, it's church on Saturday, absolutely. But I don't go to church on Saturday. I recommend keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is just simply an appointed time between you 
your family, and the Most High in the Scriptures. So on the Sabbath, you prepare your meal, you study, and that's when Yahweh will reveal to you revelation through the prophets, and you will become smart and intelligent, and you'll gain wisdom because you're asking from the person who can give it. Not from some person standing behind a pulpit, none of that. From Friday when the sun sets until Saturday when the sun sets, you should be breaking bread with your brothers and sisters, you should be in the word, and you should have that day set apart. Don't cause anybody else to work. If you're going to go somewhere, make sure your bills are paid. Do all that stuff prior. It's not, it's, not your, it's not that you can't drive. It's not that you can't turn on light switches. Those are all Talmudic man-made lies. Just keep the law that's in the Sabbath. Don't cause other people to work. Make your food and prep your food before so that you don't have to do any type of work. It's just a day of rest. If Yahweh rested... It's for us to rest. I'll get into the teaching on the Sabbath again, but I already have a lot of that in my, uh, the link in my bio on my YouTube channel has all of these teachings, and uh, some of them are mixed up with other teachings, so you might have to go through them, but I have to hop off of here for the night, guys. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around. I love breaking bread with brothers and sisters, especially on the Sabbath, um, but I'm going to spend some time with my son and my wife, and um with Yahweh. That's what that's what today's all about. And I wanted to come on here and share time with my brothers and sisters here because I know a lot of you uh, will be on the new earth. And I would love to be spending time with you now so that when we get to that point, we can look back and we can say, man, you remember all the times we were reaching out, trying to reach people and this and that? I hope we remember these days. But my son's here, so I will talk to you guys soon. Shalom.